Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Contest Prep University. I'm Joe Klimczewski with Adam Atkinson. That was actually take two. That's why we're kind of laughing here. Uh, but we're going to do a phenomenal, I think it's a phenomenal topic today, the rise or resurrection of natural bodybuilding. So, uh, Adam, the reason I was a little bit surprised and happy you brought this up is I do feel like there is a resurrection of natural bodybuilding, a lot of renewed interest. And it comes after a long, long time where people who are kind of new to the sport always gravitate, of course, toward the NPC to get to the IFBB, uh, even first time competitors like I want my IFBB pro card. And I think a lot of people either just don't even realize or discount that if you are a drug free competitor, there are a lot of opportunities, both in great organizations, but to have a fruitful career where you're competing on a level playing field. Um, I personally don't have any moral or or value hangups on either. Uh, I just find that it becomes a little bit of a two different sport mentality. If you're going to go down the road of using PEDs and consider yourself an enhanced physique sport athlete, uh, I was talking to a client of mine this morning who is a total general population kind of guy, but he does kind of like the sport. He he pays attention to it. There's a little bit of a hobby, and uh, and just that that lure that's always there. Well, you know, I wanted to stay natural, but if I you know really want to win, I just need a little bit of this. And then all of a sudden, well, that helped. Let me take a little bit more. Or what's next? And now I won something. I get to the next level. These people are bigger, better. So what's next? Again, I have no qualm with that. I certainly like people to be healthy and do things in an above board way that keeps them safe. Um, but again, don't forget, there's this whole arena where you can compete naturally. So uh, t tell me, tell me in your words, why you thought this was a good time to bring up this topic. Yeah. Well, the NPC has taken a step forward to bring natural bodybuilding to the athletes and, you know, uh, me and you have a lot of experience, uh, probably more than almost anybody with drug-free athletes. And I, I wanted to give this some time before we touch base on it. And now I'm seeing more podcasts, um, with so-called experts who have no business in natural bodybuilding, kind of stating their opinion. I was like, now's a great time to talk to the expert which is you as well um and and one of the guys made a podcast saying that he did a drug free show and there were insulin needles everywhere backstage and i'm like come on dude one that's never going to happen um two yeah maybe some of those guys did use but you're not going to see evidence of it at a show and i thought that was the most extreme um controversy i've ever seen i couldn't even believe the guy talked about it um but you know it it just sounded really uneducated and really far-fetched and i mean i i think more people would talk about this story um if that was truly the case and maybe he did muscle mania he didn't really talk about what federation he did because we all know muscle mania you just signed a piece of paper that said i am drug free and like a lot of people weren't um there were other organizations like the imbf and the wnbf that actually did polygraph um the ocb um and they took the time to make sure that the athletes were natural. So on, on a lar larger rant here, that's kind of one of the reasons I wanted to wait to bring it up, but bring it up now. Well, and it's great. And it, it's interesting. And I think very good that you start with a little bit of a controversy because I, that's always been there. I was 11 years old when I started lifting weights with great intent and by the time I was 15, I knew I was going to become a pro bodybuilder, thought I was going to become Mr. Olympia, but I was incredibly naive in, in what that took, of course. But I did compete in my first contest by 20. Uh, at 27, I was a WNBF pro, spent about 15 or so years as a WNBF pro, uh, really improving every step of the way before I retired. And, and I will say that part of the reason I stayed natural is is still the reason I do to this day, which is if you take 
PEDs for the sport, where is the end and will you be okay with that? And I had already, I guess, seen some people, even locally, there was some, you know, young kid in our gym who just blew up. And by 19 years old, he literally had a heart attack and had to drop out of college because he was using PEDs without supervision. And I thought, you know, I just, I don't want to be that person who, let's say I had success. Let's say I gained 40 pounds of muscle and had great success. When do you stop? Are you going to be okay coming back off? Like if that was your identity, do you then want to stay on TRT for the rest of your life as a 20 or 30 year old? So I just... I just never had enough desire to want to go that route. Even now that I understand there could be safe, decent ways, minimum effective dose and maintain your health in a, in a, in a good way. You know, it's just, it's just not interesting to me. Uh, although, like I said, I know people who it is, and I have even counseled a couple of my clients along the way, people who were natural drug-free world champions to say, man, if you want to go that route, you are an Olympian. Like you have those genetics. I think that's a big question to ask, but, but coming back to your controversy, all along that journey, there has always been a lot of contention that, oh yeah, sure. They're not all natural. Cause you see a Doug Millo, Doug Miller, you know, you see a Sean Clarita, when he was natural, you see, you know, even Lane Norton has got accused of, of doing steroids. You see people with really good genetics. And it's like, yeah, those are the people with really good genetics. You can be drug free. I mean, you, you know, you, you bring up Martin Daniels, often a WMBF overall world champion who is only about five, seven. And when he won, he was 195 and he looked like he was 250, but he was only 195. If he was using steroids, he would have been 285. So, you know, all, all the naysayers who think there's a lot of controversy, you know, step up, look at the drug testing policies, see what they do for class winners and so forth. And I, I think you'll see that it's a very, very relative and, and true sport. Yeah, absolutely. That should always be accusations of people not being natural. The natural bodybuilders should be that good. You know, and, and it's always been the case, you know, that these great athletes always get accused of, you know, using. Now, one thing I always notice is some of them were way smaller in person than I thought, especially with like clothes on. But then when you see how shredded they are, it makes them look absolutely huge, you know. So, um, you know, I know it's um it's tough for people to digest and. I think it's really important that we kick off the right standards and the right rules and the right drug testing to make sure that the sport can one be legitimate and two that, you know, people play fairly. And, uh, I think within its first year, we have to start somewhere and there has to be money that builds up in the Federation. Cause I see people talking about, more frequent testing for winners. And, and I think absolutely. But within a first year of bringing natural bodybuilding to the NPC, you know, we, we've got to look at participation first. These shows are going to be relatively smaller. Um, and I, I think one thing I want to bring up and I kind of wanted your opinion on is what do you think about being three years drug free versus where a lot of the federations were seven. Um, do you feel a certain way about that? Do you feel like three years is long enough being off um, to compete? It's funny you asked that. That's exactly where my brain was going for a next segue. Um, I mean, yeah, originally all the drug free organizations kind of settled in on seven, and then I think one or two went to 10. Uh, which, you know, I mean, even at seven, that's that's so penalizing. If, if somebody says, oh, yeah, I, I did a cycle two years ago, but I'm never going to do that again. I want to be natural. It's like, wow, now I have to wait five more years or eight more years. Um, I, I really do think three is is enough. Um, I, I'm sure you could I'm sure you could show some residual impact, but pharmacologically, 
as soon as you're coming off of a cycle, let's say you're doing nothing, even if you've tapered off sensibly, without that anabolic environment, first of all, you're really going to be playing at a deficit for a long time or forever because of the endogenous you know, dysregulation that you've created. And so I, you know, I'm working with a client right now who, who used for only just maybe a year. And even though he is... Uh, I believe under 30, you know, he's struggling with having to find the right balances of TRT because he he just he will never be normal again. And if you're going to compete as a drug free competitor, even if you've been clean for three years, I, I cannot assume that you're ever going to be back up to normal. And TRT disqualifies you in most organizations. So I think there's going to have to be a little bit more sophistication, whether somebody as large as the NPC can do this to say, you know, here is our testing policy. And when we test you, you need to be in certain ranges. So maybe something like TRT is allowable, uh, but you have to be under, I don't know, 800 nanograms per deciliter or something as, as a male. And then you're going to have to be pretty proficient at doing some off-season testing. Because even with TRT, you can just kind of come up and then cycle down and be on TRT. So you know, the, the gold standard of, of a polygraph test, I know isn't perfect. It's it's a good first filter, but you're really going to have to be serious about drug tests, even if you push the cost onto the competitors, that there has to be some serious, you know, testing policies for it to be legitimate. Absolutely. I think you're correct that, you know, people are being really hard on people who've made mistakes and used uh, the ramifications after might be more difficult than people realize. And uh, also, I think as a push to get some of these athletes clean um, or give them incentive to not be on PEDs. Um, and, and you have to think of the people who are probably going to stop doing PEDs to compete naturally they're probably people who aren't competing at a high level you know if you're competing at that high level already you're probably not going to stop and be natural and try to do a lesser competition i mean maybe people might but i think that fight is going to be a lot harder and i think three years gives people incentive to get clean uh there's a lot of young people using SARMs and stuff like that right out the gates because there's just so much information out there. I guarantee if I was a bodybuilder and I was 19 or 20, I would have already been using some kind of steroid or some kind of SARM at this point because the internet availability is just so high. Um, whether I knew what I was doing or not, probably not. But, uh, you know, I, I think I would be using, but I think at a, a certain point you would see stuff like natural bodybuilding come up and say, maybe I should choose this route because I'm not as big as I thought I would be by using, et cetera. It does give people incentive. I do think the ramifications for getting caught should be steeper. Uh, I believe it's two years and... I think that's just a normal off season for some people. I, I think they sure. should make the penalty as long as uh, being clean should be at least right. Cause we're asking for three years clean. If you get caught, I think the ramification needs to be three, three years. I think that bill needs to match or at least there be a five or, you know, five or 12 month penalty where it's you have to take four years off because you got caught, you know? Well, I, I think you're really onto something in that these are all going to be very, very peripheral issues with, with a small population. So uh, to your point, if somebody's using and they're aggressively pursuing a career in that direction for them to just completely do a 180 and say, now I'm going to be clean and instantly look for a place I can compete. Um, I, I don't think they're going to then want to cheat the system, right? If you're going to just stay on something, just stay in the PED friendly organizations. Uh, so it's just not the biggest deal. You know, those who really want to be natural are going to take those steps. Uh, I, I do like what you said, because going back to it, not being a moral or value decision, uh, you used the phrase a few minutes ago, like if someone had made the mistake of using PEDs, 
I wouldn't even phrase it as a mistake. It's just experimentation. Like you said, you know, 25 ish, 30 years ago, as soon as things like Trib came out, um, some of the early pro hormones, like I was all over it because the line in the sand was anabolic steroids. These were natural supplements, not yet even tested or, or researched uh, for their effect. And I was trying them, you know, it's, you can buy them at GNC, then it's, it's fair game. Um, but I just, I had my line in the sand and that was it for those reasons. I think availability is also different today. You know, it seems very, very easy to get things where, you know, maybe thankfully back when I was young, it just, you, you just weren't going to come across it that, that easily. Uh, but let's, let's, let's start talking about the divide between what the NPC is seeking to do and then some of the traditional drug-free organizations. Uh, do you think, and have you seen with like the Ben Weeder classic, uh, a, a, a really strict, legitimate process for testing? Yeah, I have. It's getting stricter now because they're really bringing in the polygraphs right now. So, uh, you know, there was a certain competitor who won the Weeder as a pro, um, who went to the Olympia, got their Olympia qualification that shouldn't have. Um, I won't say who it was to be controversial, but my athlete got second that year and I, my inbox was just blown up. Um, my athlete later this year won, um, even with the same drug testing standards, but to my understanding, they're going to drug test the top two athletes at the weeder, just in case there's a failure, they have a polygraph and a drug test from the second place winner so they can pass that down to my understanding i don't want to speak for them but they're really starting to push the polygraphs and they're actually disallowing um the trt so that is on the the banned substance list so uh this is interesting because i i've had athletes who just started trt this year who were just full blown wanted to be natural. And uh, it kind of stinks because we didn't really know what was to come. But I think that they're doing a really nice job. I think one thing that the natural federations like the OCB and the WNBF have always had a hard time with the polygraphs are expensive. And when you literally polygraph 70 some athletes, that's a large margin of your profits. Um, or even just ha having athletes pay for those polygraphs, it starts making the sport very, very expensive. And I think doing the right amount of polygraphs and the right amount of testing, because really outside of the top five, what does it really matter? You know, I've always kind of thought that because hopefully no one's cheating to get sixth or 10th place. You know, I'm not really concerned at that later end of the pack. Um, and I think where the NPC is really going to get some steam is renting the venue, having the banners, all of that stuff is expensive. Well, since they do natural and untested shows, they can host them the same weekend and basically really get some steam and uh, put some money back into this, you know. And I think that's where the federations have been divided have really struggled. The money is just not there. The prize money isn't what it used to be. And uh, I think they're really on to something. Mm -hmm. Well, they, they certainly have the money and, excuse me, the, uh, the infrastructure. M me, just traditionally being a WNBF pro, that's where I gained my pro status. And then I was the, the chief science editor for Chalo Publishing, who owned the WNBF for almost 15 years. So I, I knew everybody at the organization for that long. Uh, the current presidents and officers, uh, I, you know, they've been friends of mine for that long. So I, I don't just, I don't just feel an allegiance to them. I know their practices and their standards intimately. And at their world championships a couple of years ago, just as an example, I had a client who I had a couple of clients who won and as they were being tested, because here, you know, here are the top three or the top five, they immediately have to go to, to an ex to an expediter and and be escorted into a bathroom for a urinalysis test. 
and the expediter literally stands there watching them urinate into a cup. And I started walking into the bathroom just to congratulate my client. I got physically tackled. Another expediter just pushed me out of the way and said, if you go in that room, that person is disqualified. You know, you're lucky I caught you. Like that's the, I mean, that's how serious they are about maintaining their, their ethical standards. And I think because that is a known quantity, very few people ever try to game the system. Like you said, not only why would you try to cheat for sixth or 10th place, why would you even risk an entire contest season and all of that money and all of that time just to ultimately get caught? So I, I do think it's going to be so few and far between and then, as, as another example, if somebody pops a positive test, there is recourse. We had a WNBF world champion one time who tested positive, and he swore up and down, I am taking nothing. So but at his own expense, he got tested again, and they found a metabolite that they te- that they tr- traced back to a supplement he was taking. So it it had a DHEA or a, a pro hormone that he didn't know about. Maybe wasn't even labeled correctly on the product, and went off of that for thirty days. Got retested, and they said, "Yeah, that was it." But sorry, you still tested positive. You know that was a banned substance, and we can't give you the title. Um, so again, I mean, something that could be considered that minute. It was not anabolic steroids. His mm-hmm. testosterone level wasn't eighteen thousand, um, but you know that that's the kind of that's the kind of standard I think you have in the traditional drug free organizations, and I sure hope if the NPC is going to try to get into that market that they they get their standards up to par as well. Absolutely, that is a very scary scenario to be in as a natural competitor, and uh, you know if anyone's listening. Uh, I've always stuck to supplement companies with my natural competitors that come from, uh, they call it a GMP lab, and it's uh, like good manufacturing practices. So the stamp of approval on that is basically that they're, if the wind blew wrong in that factory, there's nothing in that factory to, you know, blow into a supplement that you're taking and then it's got DHEA in it or anything that's banned. So you're usually safe with those GMP labs. So um, I would tell people definitely stick to those because um, I've had that happen to athletes where I had bantamweight fail a drug test in the WNBF and it's like he's 146 pounds. There's <laughs> he's not taking anything. Um, but actually at the same show, I had two other athletes um test positive, and uh they were taking uh all all three of them were taking two of the same supplements, and we don't know which one it came from, but there was a metabolite that had been banned and not even in the market for I think seven years, like they, they're like, we don't even know how these clients would have obtained this, you know? So that was strange. And, uh, i never really found what supplement it was. That is a very tough thing. And it's a, it's a side tangent. I don't want to really go down too deeply, but when you're looking at WADA in organizations that are consistently, constantly monitoring for what may need to be banned next, it's pretty tough for, low resourced drug free organizations to stay on top of that and then make sure even the urinalysis and polygraph testing is adequate in addressing those those new issues so you know at some points people are asking well, what about cannabis and what if somebody tests positive for cocaine can't that be a you know thing or um uh, i don't know you know and and then some people were ta- taking certain things as a way to try to mask a polygraph like really depress my sympathetic nervous system to the point where i could pass a polygraph so now you have to test for those things so it becomes very very difficult and i understand it's never going to be perfect but i really want to emphasize how peripheral and just tangential these types of of topics will be and then when there is doubt, people can be retested. You know, these these organizations retain the right to do off-season tests or uh, test again if they think, you know, something was skewed. 
Yeah, absolutely. So what do you think, Adam, with uh, let's get back to kind of the the deciding point. You have clients come to you just getting into the sport and they're like, I don't know, Adam, should I, should I not? Should I take some Anavar? Should I get on a little TRT just to get a little bigger? You know, uh, do you have a, a strong uh, conversation perhaps already, you know, formulated where you say, okay, here's, here's why it may be best for you to stay natural for a while. Like uh, for these reasons, you know, a, just see how your genetics play out. See, see if you even like the sport or, uh, hey, you know, maybe, you know, you, you can have a great career over here. You may struggle and struggle and struggle to even get to a high national level status in the NPC, but you could be vying for a world title over here at a level playing field. What What, what is your mindset when you're describing the two different paths to new clients? Yeah, to new clients, I almost always promote natural. Uh, everyone buys shit that they don't use, you know, and a contest prep might be one of those things. You may not even make it through the prep. Um, I really like to see if an athlete has what it takes to make it through the prep uh, because we're not just, you know, program givers. We're coaches, and I really want to have an impact on my client's life. And I think the best way to do that is, you know, let's show a client that you can get there drug free. So then when they decide not to compete again, and they're a mom of four, they don't feel like they have to have Clan or Anivar to lose baby weight afterwards or get their body to a good point again. I think if you teach that right away, you, you essentially create a bunch of uh, druggies in a way where they feel like they have to have that stuff to look better. Um, I had people who are very well educated and know better and they just feel like they have to be on something. And uh, then you start getting that coaching divide because they just won't tell you when they're on, but you see their blood work and you're like, I caught you. Like, why, why are you using this? Cause your liver enzymes should not be elevated. If you know, only the supplements you're taking are on your check-in sheet right now. Yeah, I, I really see an entire spectrum of use opportunities and even personalities as it comes to this. You, you made me think of the fact that Monday we had in our live support chat in our company, the Flexible Dieting Institute, uh, a conversation about addiction. And and that's that kind of mentality you're describing where, man, now I just, you know, hey, I got a, I got a high school reunion coming up. I better do a cycle. So I look a little bigger. Like you always have to have something, you know, you're, but at the same time, they can be tools for that. I, I would rather see somebody look at it almost as a supplement to use. If, if they're down that road, then staying on forever, like we described, what's the end point? You gain 40 pounds of muscle and you just have to stay on forever. But the other part is, as we're going to talk about tomorrow in our Contest Prep University D1 Club meeting, um, you know, how, how do you even prep differently? Uh, with PEDs versus this, like when when we're talking to a diverse group like our D1 club, we have people who are using, we have people who are not using, and there are different uh, things to consider. And as you were just there describing, you know, your mentality of, you know, when, how, if, you know, you go down that whole, as you said, rabbit trail. Uh, there's just a lot to consider and value. Moral judgment aside, that's your decision. But I, I really like the way you described it. You know, stay natural initially, perhaps, just so you're not saddled with, because let's say you do decide you want to stay in as a competitor. Now you're locked in for three or seven or 10 years. You know, see what you think, see where you can go first, and then you can make those decisions. Yeah, absolutely. Final question, Adam, uh, give me a list if you have it in your mind of all of the drug-free organizations that you think are are high quality, have great promoters, great testing procedures, and people will find very competent to compete in their shows. Yeah, right now, I know Austin Carr here in Las Vegas runs a, a great ship with his, his shows. So um, he runs the NPC Natural City of Lights. And then next year in 2025, it's going to be the Las Vegas Classic, uh, the Natural Las Vegas Classic. 
And I've got to throw uh, Diamond Dave Lieberman out there because uh, he's an NPC promoter. He hosts the Natural Ohio, and he also hosts the Natural Northern USA, which before all of this other natural bodybuilding came out, I always said he was like the nas nationals of the naturals. Um, and then Gary Udit obviously runs a great show, which is the Ben Weeder Naturals, where not only can you go pro, you can also get a ticket to the Olympia if you're already a pro, compete, and win your respected classes. Mm, great. So NPC, obviously making a strong move in your mind. And of course, I have to tip my hat to my WNBF family, INBF as their feeder amateur organization. Um, I, I have to say, I, I embarrassingly lose a lot of momentum after that. So obviously the OCB has become large in the last 20 to 30 years. Uh, I believe the NGA still has contest. Is it the PNBF who runs the the natural Olympia? Um, I think it's the INBA and then the pro I, version is the PNBA, I believe. The NBA. Okay. See, yep. see, that's, that's how, uh, how forgetful I am of some of these, these words. And, and, and that kind of goes back to the argument we've had for 30 plus years. Like, why are there so many? I love free enterprise, but man, we, we lose a lot of potential resourcing by being so fractured. But, you know, I'll just say for those of you, obviously, you can look up different organizations, you know, look for the longevity, make sure you're looking at sizes of shows, the length of time promoters have been there doing the show. Uh, sometimes I have a lot of new competitors who go visit contests in a certain organization before they make that decision. But but obviously, a lot of good places to start. Geography matters. You know, you don't always have to think of the biggest or the best show in the country, you know, stay where you can get a foothold. But again, Adam, thanks for bringing up this topic. I think it's going to be great. Hopefully, we get a lot of conversation about this because it's just almost, as I said, two different sports and with those disqualifying walls between using and then being in a natural organization, you know, it is a little bit prohibitive sometimes if you take a step into the PED realm. So make good decisions, guys. And uh, I know you do well. We'll see you next time in Contest Prep University.